Right, good afternoon. Welcome to this last session of the day. Um, this, as you know, is all about uh, emerging technologies, those technologies which are here now, but not fully um, uh, available to us all, but will be any minute now. So we need to know what do they do, uh, what will they enable us to do which we can't do now, and, and how will they change our lives? So we, it's in two parts. We'll have two presentations. The first one, as you can see, is on uh, the Mozilla Foundation's uh, open badges infrastructure. And the second one, which will be in the second part of the, uh, this session, uh, will be on Google Glass. So the first up, um, I'd like to introduce Doug Belshaw of the Mozilla Foundation and Tim Riches, CEO of Digital Me. Over to you, guys. Thank you very much, Vaughan. Am I on? Yes, You're excellent. I'm also being filmed. Hello, ma'am. Um, so I've got a bit of a cold today, so if you don't understand my dodgy northern accent, overlaid with a thick cold, then please do wave and tell me to go back over things. I will do that. So um, I'm Doug Belshaw. I'm the web literacy lead for the nonprofit Mozilla Foundation. Um, I used to be on the Badgers team. I'm going to be talking about that today. Um, and by the end of this, hopefully, you'll have an understanding of what open badges are, um, what they're not, and how you can start using them in your organization. So just a little bit to just kick us off. Um, it's a new way of credentialing learning. So it's, it's separate from the assessment itself. You can assess things however you want. Like you can have a conversation with somebody, you can do um, an e-learning kind of thing. Any way you can assess is exactly the same as you've done previously, um, but the, the credentialing of that is, is separate from the assessment, and that's what we're focusing on today. So this is Tim. This is Tim Richards from Digital Me. He's CEO of Digital Me, um, another nonprofit. Tim's working with us with the Mozilla Foundation to do badge partnerships and programs in Europe. So Tim's been a, 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 valuable, a valuable kind of thought leader um, and partner with us. Um, he can be reached at, at triches or tim.riches at digitalme.co.uk. Um, this is me. I'm Doug Belshaw from the Mozilla Foundation um, at, at DAJ Belshaw on Twitter. That's the quickest way of getting hold of me usually. But I also respond to emails. I don't just ignore you. Um, Doug at mozillafoundation.org. These slides are all on SlideShare, or they will be soon. Um, and if you need to go back to any of these slides at the end of what we're talking about, just tell us to scoot back and we can do that for you. So um, Mozilla is actually a global nonprofit. And sometimes when I talk, people don't realize that. We play in the same sandpit as Google, as you're going to hear about in a moment, um, Microsoft, Facebook, people like that. But we're actually a global nonprofit. If you're interested, I can tell you where we get our money from later on. But we are free to develop on behalf of users and be on behalf of the open web, which sets us apart from the rest of the tech companies, I would suggest. So we do um, lots and lots of different things. And this is our chief lizard wrangler, as she's known, Mitchell Baker. And she says that Mozillians are champions of a web where people know more, do more, and do better. And that's the whole ethos behind what we do at Mozilla. We do lots of different things. I've got a Firefox OS phone in my bag. That is a, a mobile operating system which is entirely just the web. It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Because it seems to me that we're ending up in the days of this website is optimized for Internet Explorer 800 by 600 resolution in the way that we've got app stores for iOS, Android, Windows, all that kind of stuff. Whereas if you develop for the web, as you can do with Firefox OS, then it means that if you can make a web app, you can deploy it to any device. So we do lots of things, and it's all for the good of the web. Um, I work at the moment on the WebMaker program around web literacy, trying to get people moved away from being elegant consumers of the web towards having some kind of agency. So the way that Mozilla works, and the reason this is important, is that anybody can be involved. You can be a Mozillian. Some people in this room might already be a Mozillian. I started working for Mozilla, as it were, being a volunteer, showing up before I actually joined Mozilla as a paid contributor. And only about one out of every 40 people who um, contribute to the Mozilla project are paid contributors. The rest are a huge worldwide army of people who contribute to the project on a volunteer basis. So um, that's Mozilla, and I think it's important to set the scene because we're not selling anything here. Everything that you see is free and open source, and you can start using it today. We're going to be talking about um, open badges, about what they are. Um, when I had a quick show of hands there, although some people came in afterwards, most people kind of knew a little bit about open badges or weren't so familiar with them. So we're going to go through open badges very, very quickly. Then we're going to talk, well, Tim's going to talk about why we need a new learning currency, why we need to move away from existing metaphors. Um, we're going to quickly run you through some examples, and then we'll have a conclusion and Q&A. We might not have time to go through my latest venture, which is a web literacy map. If you're interested in that, then I can talk to you one-to-one -one after this session. Tim. 
Oh, there's an entrance. Can you hear me okay? Good. So I'm Tim Riches. Let me go back on. Uh, from Digital Me, not uh, Despicable Me. Has someone uh, misread my business card a little earlier? Maybe bald, but I'm not. I'm not evil as well. I don't, I don't think I am anyway. So um, certainly not going to find this presentation evil. I don't hope. So, um, so what are badges? Aren't they just for kids? Uh, when we think about badges, you know, we think about scouting metaphors, and that's really useful. You know, it kind of gets the message over straight away. It's about doing challenges, missions, things that interest you, about gathering all of those things together um, and then showing them off. Uh, but actually, in terms of badges, um, they're not a new thing. They're used around the internet already, and they communicate trust. Something like the eBay Power Seller badge, you know, you've seen it lots of times before, those of you who are keen eBay. And if you see that, you trust it, and you're much more likely to buy from that person. Um, so badges are actually behind many multinational companies and driving their business models. Because if you took the eBay Power Seller badge out of eBay, you kind of have Gumtree. So in terms of Mozilla Open badges, then, they're a standard to communicate skills across the web. Um, so the way I think about it is a bit like email. So email allows people like uh, Microsoft to talk to Google every day. You don't think about that standard. The communication just goes on. It's the gubbings underneath or the engine that makes this thing work. So it's just a way to communicate skills. I mean, it's actually a, such a, a simple, simple idea. It's one of those ideas where you just think, why hasn't someone done this before? And essentially, it's just an image file with data baked into it. Um, but from a non-technical point of view, this is what's in a badge. It's a description of the badge badge, uh, the criteria, what you have to do to earn the badge, um, really crucially evidence, you know, what's the evidence that you've actually um, uh, gained that badge and whether it's uh, what the date was that it was issued and whether it expires as well. You can put an expiry date so you could have it, uh, have it so you can have to earn it uh, once every year. So the concept is quite simple. You can pick badges up anywhere. It, ha it can be online through an e-learning platform, but it could be face-to-face -face as well. It could be from local shops or from a charity program, a volunteering program. It could be from the steel industry when you're working face-to-face. -face. It, it, it could be anywhere. When you've got your badges, you put them into something called a backpack. So that's the kind of scouting metaphor taken one step forward. It's the patches that are on top of the backpack. Uh, and then once you've got them in the backpack, you can then share them through social media sites. So badges are a way to gain credentials for online or offline and then show those cr credentials anywhere across the web. So they're a huge leap forward from this idea of a kind of dead and lifeless CV or a certificate, which just doesn't have any of that data within it. Um, I'm not going to click you through the backpack, but um, uh, just very quickly, uh, this is a backpack with the, the badges in them. If you want to earn one today, um, if you go to digitalme.co.uk forward slash badge the UK, and if you're interested in joining this group, Badge the UK, this campaign, uh, just fill in your details there and you'll get issued with a badge and then you can come back and uh, you can earn that online and put it in your backpack and, and go through the process. And I think that's probably the best way to actually understand it is to do it, do it yourself. So just a couple of things that make open badges different. Uh, firstly, is that they're open and free. And like Doug was saying, anyone can get involved in this ecosystem. Um, there's not one kind of awarding body for open badges. You don't have to submit open badges to us or Mozilla. You can create your own badges and just put them into an ecosystem. Um, another really important point is that the data is owned by you. That's absolutely crucial. So you'll have seen badges within other uh, LMS systems, for example, but the badges are trapped often within that LMS system. So the data belongs to you, you put them in your backpack, and you decide when you share them. So for example, if you earn your finger painting badge in primary school, you're not necessarily going to want to put that on LinkedIn. So you control where you put your, your own data. So I'm just going to outline why I think we need a new learning currency. Um, from the sector we work in, which is education, and schools, and in and out of schools work. Um, but I think a lot of this applies to the professional world as well. Um, so um, the first thing for us is that we just don't recognize all the really cool stuff that kids do. Um, we have this weird system where you either pass or fail at the end of the system, and it's based on kind of repetitive cognitive skills, memory and comprehension, um, not the cool stuff. And just the picture behind here, uh, we were invited to, to go to BET last week, 
I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of, that, of the BET show before. Huge kind of assault on the senses. Um, but we were given this space to work with kids, and so we got the kids to do a whole load of digital making activities and teach the teachers, and they gave the teachers the badges, which I thought was a really nice kind of flip. And uh, this young person here is designing an animation, and then they're transferring that animation through an Arduino, which is a kind of mini computer like a Raspberry Pi, uh, and then they're showing the animation off on this physical device. Now, all of the young people who went through that absolutely loved it. It was really exciting. All the kids, uh, when they played the games, beat the, 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 the uh, teachers at the high score as well. Um, but they, they really enjoyed it. It maps to the new computing curriculum, but the tragedy is that none of that stuff gets recognized in school, unless you take the GCSE in Python, which a lot of kids don't go and actually do, then you lose all those skills and you're saying to kids that, look, you're a failure, that's not important, your passion, your interest isn't, isn't important. And I think for that reason alone, we need a new way to recognize those skills. Second is that we're measuring the wrong stuff. Uh, there's so much data out there. Uh, there was another study out this week um, it was an independent group, cross-party group, that's saying that we should remove the kind of management of education out of the education secretary, whichever party, and have a, a party of teachers and educators and industry uh, and academics all working together um, to manage that. But if you look at things like the OECD, um, you see what you would expect with manual skills. They're being automated out of existence. Um, the top graph going up is all those metacognitive skills. Uh, the synthesis of information, working, collaborating, team working, problem solving, all those kind of things. And the scary bit is the, the orange one in the middle that's going down, which is the, non, is the routine cognitive skills, the routine cognitive skills. Um, and the robots know this, and they're coming for our jobs. Um, what's happening, uh, what, a, a recent report by Frey and Osborne um, said that they thought 50% of jobs uh, service jobs um, were going to be outsourced to, to, to robots in the next sort of, 10, 20 years. So it just reinforces the fact we're teaching the wrong stuff and we're measuring the wrong stuff. Um, this is another quote from the CBI. So industry aren't impressed either. They don't feel like the right skills are coming through. Um, and a quote from Google, just saying that for them, qualifications are just worthless in terms of actually predicting whether someone's successful in the workplace or not. Uh, and then finally, CVs are just a bit crap. Um, you know, there's, I was listening to a talk by the guy from GitHub the other day, and he puts out um, a call for a job, and he gets 100 CVs or 1,000 CVs on his desk. He says, what on earth am I supposed to do with those? They just don't communicate the richness of what someone has learned. He's lucky because GitHub, if you know it at all, is this kind of code repository. So he just goes and looks at what, at what they do. And now he says, before anyone comes in, I actually know a lot about that person, and that's where we're getting to, hopefully, with open badges. So one question we get asked a lot is how, you know, if, if you agree, you know, from your perspective, do we need this new currency, a new way to recognize a broader set of skills? How do we actually develop currency? The first, I think, is actually to start with the user. And this is a, a graph that's from a platform. It's called MateWaves. It's a school-based platform. And this is what happened when badges were introduced into the system. And it was fascinating, that the power of giving individual feedback to a learner. There's lots of research out there already that shows us it's one of the most powerful uh, motivators uh, and, uh, and ways to increase standards. So for feedback to a learner, uh, recognizing them is, is a really key thing. Um, the second thing for me is, is we need to start thinking about learning and the value of learning completely differently. So, you know, in, we hear a lot about MOOCs, you know, and delivering courses en masse, on scale, but it's actually, to me, it's, the, it's almost delivering the old model, but just on a larger scale. Now, the retailers already know this, people like Amazon already know this, that um, if you have lots, they have an unlimited shelf space at Amazon, but they actually make most of their money out of products that just a few people buy, not out of the blockbusters. So, an ecosystem, where hundreds, thousands, millions of courses are developed by people who know their particular industry perspective, that's where the value will come through the long tail rather than, lots of, uh, rather than a few major courses. And we're starting to see that with the amount of badges that are being created. And uh, those figures are out of date now. We're at around about 300,000 badges that have been issued. Um, 
way over 2,000 issuers, 50,000 backpacks, and a huge growth. So there's a massive desire when you talk to people about the idea and, and you actually empower them to start creating a new way to credential their learners from their perspective, from their expertise. People are really hungry to get involved and use those tools uh, and start issuing badges. The third is through endorsement. So one of the projects we're working on at the moment is called Badge the UK. And what we're interested in is something called connected learning, so connecting uh, the workplace through to school. And all of these different organizations, all these brands have value. And the brands that you work with have value. We don't necessarily need an endorsing body. We do sometimes, but uh, a lot of value can come from brands. And then fourth, we're not, we haven't seen this yet, but I'm convinced we will over time uh, once the standard really takes hold, is people uh, rating badges and rating users, rating experts. So we start to see actually the users, the learners, start to become really effective peer mentors uh, because they, they can actually display and prove that they've learned these skills and become valued community members. And we, we see that already happening in sites like Stack Overflow. Finally, for us, uh, authenticity is really important. Uh, it's one of the five areas uh, that really increases learning in school if learners can see that there's a connection to the outside world. And then in the future, I think what we'll, where the value will come from is discoverability. So you earn all of these badges, you put them in a backpack, you've got all of this data. When you start making that data available to other people, it's just going to be an incredibly powerful recruitment tool. So I'm sure we're going to see that uh, some interesting products um, develop. So I'm going to hand over to Doug now, who's going to tell you a little bit about some of the organizations who are already making badges within the, the ecosystem, some, some brands that you, will, that you will recognize. Cheers, Tim. Um, so as you can see, there's already some big names using badges, so it's not a case of badges gaining traction. It's a, it's a case of like, when, when are you going to start using badges, really? Um, so, so you can go to NASA. You can go to the NASA website and get badges for their Starlight rover mission. You can go to, if you were in the city of Chicago, if you're a young person, if you went to pretty much any one of the institutions for their summer of learning, then you get a badge, and those badges join together, almost like in Trivial Pursuit, when you put your badges into the pie, and then you level up into like a, a meta-level badge, and then you have a city-wide showcase. So all these people are using badges in very different ways. Let me just show you some examples. This is my favorite example of badges. Um, Tim didn't say, actually, he's, he's too humble to say so, but he was very successful in, in getting one of the first grants to do some work around badges, the only person, the only organization in Europe to do so. Uh, the MacArthur Foundation, a very large philanthropic organization in the US, um, kind of seeded the ecosystem with some grants to do some work in specific areas. Um, Tim's organization did it around um, sports reporting and journalism, getting young, young people's passion about sports and moving it into sports reporting. But this one here, this is the Sweetwater Foundation. Now, I still don't understand this completely, but aquaponics is something to do with fish and poo and plants and eating them. I don't really understand, but it's got something to do with sustainable food. Um, and this happens anywhere, but it also it happens in large abandoned factories in places like Detroit and, and other places as well. So you've got young people learning skills around how to handle fish, how to do stuff with plants, how to be an entrepreneur, all of these skills, which are very difficult to certificate, very difficult to credential. So they're using open badges for that. Um, and they can then use that credential in an emerging market to show their skills and then be able to set up their own business and show what they know. Um, I've already mentioned the NASA Starlight Rover badge. You can go there today and get your Starlight Rover digital badges. Workforce.io is a bit like LinkedIn in the sense that you can put your academic credentials on there. You can put your job history if you've, if you've started work already. But this is particularly for people who are going into the job market, Workforce.io. You can put your open badges on there alongside your academic credentials and your employment or internship history. Passport is a lovely example of a, of a, like a, a value chain. So Purdue University in the States, they've built basically a learning management system with badges at the core. So if you're a professor at that university, you can, you can make an, an e-learning course um, and you can put badges in there for pretty much whatever you want. Um, and then you can issue badges to people who do the things that you want them to do. But they've also got an iPad app, which means that if you go to an interview and people haven't heard of badges and say, well, what are these things? You can show on the iPad app, you can hand them over, you can, they can see what you've done, which augments the traditional kind of academic transcript. And I think that's a really nice, slick use of badges. Um, often in the military, people come back from war zones and, and places having served with skills that aren't credentialed. 
Um, and so veterans in the US have already started getting jobs based on open badges, which they've earned through demonstrating the skills um, that they've learned overseas. Kentech, I haven't checked in with them for a while, but um, they're based in uh, Holland, I think, and Belgium. And they have been using like an, a virtual reality simulator in vocational learning and issuing open badges for the skills that are learned in that kind of environment. I saw downstairs someone using a virtual welder, which looked quite cool. Um, you don't have to call them open badges if you don't want to. If it doesn't fit in with your organizational culture, um, people sometimes, like Tim said before, sometimes people think they're a bit kind of scout-like. My son's in the scouts, he's in the beavers, um, and sometimes people think it's a bit childish. Well, that's fine, you don't have to use the term badges. You can use digital micro-credentials. You can say um, that they're granular achievements. You can use whatever languages you want as long as they align with the open badges infrastructure, or OBI. Um, I've already mentioned the city of Chicago. That was so successful last year that they're now moving to a, a year-long program where at any time you can earn badges at any of the institutions in Chicago um, and show your skills having leveled up. Um, that's all the organizations involved in Chicago. Um, and Tim is going to give you an example of how we're using that in the UK. I think you've already touched on it, Tim, but I'm just yeah. going to throw it. Yeah, just, just very quickly then, um, what we're trying to achieve uh, with Badge the UK is we're working with teachers and students and charities and employers and trying to develop this learning currency, um, agree on criteria for learning, for example, working with big employers, um, but also working with schools and then agreeing on a criteria and then creating badges which represent um, those skills. So it could be developing a project, for example, doing some digital making with code and then presentation skills, uh, etc. So if you're interested in getting involved in that from a, from a company point of view, it'd be great to have you involved. If you wanted to um, launch a brief, uh, like a challenge or a mission, as we call them, for young people, that would be great. Uh, or just promote the project. There's lots more about that uh, online. Um, Okay, so I skip through these. Uh, I just want to show you this uh, badge library. So coming back to the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about BET and the BET show, and this is how young people access some of those activities. So this is a sort of mission library. Um, they click to open the badge. So this is a badge sort of in practice. They click to open a badge, see what it is they need to do to complete that mission. And then once they've completed that mission, then put some evidence uh, to that, whether it's a blog or someone seeing that that's happened in practice. And this is this Arduino device, device I was talking about before, this gaming um, device. So how do you get involved? Do you want to design an issue and create badges? Well, the good news is there's lots of tools out there. And I'm guessing that most of you will use some sort of a learning management system. Um, but if you're in schools, there's the MateWave site. Um, there's also the Moodle site, which is obviously incredibly popular. Blackboard, uh, Achievery, which is based in the States. Mozilla are just developing some code at the moment called Badge Kit. Uh, and that's a set of, um, basically, it's a way, uh, an easy way to take uh, the, 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 the tools like the, that help you create badges and then integrate them into your own website. Uh, the APIs that allow you to create, issue, and discover badges. PebblePad, I believe, made an announcement last week, another learning management system. Badge OS, which is a plugin for uh, WordPress, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could just build your own solution. And like Doug was saying earlier on, it's open source software. So if you have software developers and you want to do something which deeply integrates with your product, um, lots of people are going down that route. The bigger organizations are going down, down that kind of route. So lots of ways to get involved. Um, I should also mention the design canvas. So this is downloadable free from the Digital Me website. Um, it's inspired by the business model generation canvas. It's been incredibly popular as a design tool, not in terms of the visual design, but in terms of the learning design. So it just it's a, it's a kind of group work tool that uh, digs into the key questions, the key building blocks, uh, the questions you need to answer in order to create a good badge. So understanding who your user is, who your issuer is, who's going to display that badge, why they're going to display it, the value proposition, because there's, there's a danger of creating a lot of these badges and we haven't really thought through why people might want to earn them. Uh, and then the criteria, splitting criteria and behaviors down, et cetera. And that will give you a kind of map to use, a roadmap to use when you're going to design your own, uh, your own badge. So in terms of how they're being used at the moment, 
lots of different ways, but here are a few. Uh, feedback and motivation, I think, is one, one key area. Um, uh, I, I showed you the effect that, that badges made when we introduced them into a platform earlier on. Uh, the development of soft skills or 21st century skills or skills that don't fall into the academic box uh, somehow. Uh, so that's, that's certainly a, a big area. For connected learning, that's, that's a big area for us. So that's connecting different worlds, so connecting the school world to employers. So we've got a currency that can travel. Um, seeing more and more continual professional development work going on at the moment. Um, so ar around teachers, university, uh, lecturers, etc. And some organizations have been working with us recently to take what an existing business model, an awarding body model, and take it one step on. So start to uh, badge um, traditional qualifications digitally, but look how smaller granular achievements can fit into that business model as well. So they're just some of the ways uh, that they're being used at the moment. And I think that's just about where we're going to, where we're going to, to wrap now. So hopefully that's given you a good introduction to what open badges are, uh, some of the reasons we see why we think we need this new learning currency and how the value is beginning to develop and, and some, some live case studies. And um, do go to digitalme.co.uk forward slash badge the UK if you fancy earning a badge there. Uh, and we'll also be around tomorrow for um, uh, a kind of drop-in surgery, I think, uh, at the exhibition somewhere to talk in more depth if, you, if you'd like to discuss open badges in more depth. So, so we've got five minutes. Um, people do usually have lots of... Um, if you're interested in the web literacy standard on math that I've been working on, then we can talk about that afterwards. I've got time to, to do that now. I'm going to leave that on the screen so you've got Twitter handles and some links which you might find useful. But has anyone got any questions? We've got some mics, I think, somewhere. Have we? Hopefully. Has someone got a microphone? Just shout very loudly. Just shout. Gentlemen here. This is a very good question. Yes, how can we do that? Have you got any answers to that? No, seriously, I'm asking you a question back. <laughs> no, right, okay. So there's, there's basically well, several ways you could do things. So I could issue a badge to, yourself, to myself, and indeed I have done that. Somebody said, couldn't you just issue yourself the awesome badge? And I said, yes, I'll do this now. And I have done that. But the badge says, issued by Doug Belshaw to Doug Belshaw, and the criteria is entirely spurious, yeah? Now, I could pretend to be um, Durham University issuing me my PhD, yeah? But the thing is, when I, when, it goes, when I click through that link, you have to put the URL in there, then it doesn't mention me on the, it wouldn't mention me on the Durham University pages. You'd have to hack into that website as well. So there's always that kind of link of verifiability. In terms of standards, in terms of one badge being more useful than another, well, we kind of already have this system with, let's just use the example of universities or organizations. We already know which universities are better to hire people from than others. We already know which ones are higher than low in league tables. So firstly, we will have league tables and stuff for badges. If that doesn't get built, then Mozilla will build it, but there's an opportunity for any of you here or anybody you know to build that kind of system. Um, but also, you can delve into the criteria and see what that person had to do. And if that doesn't satisfy you and the person has put some evidence into the badge, let's say it's a public speaking badge, for example, then you can see that person speaking and actually having those skills of public speaking. So you can look at the evidence in a way and delve into the credential in a way that you couldn't previously before. Yeah? So it's an immersion system, um, but the value comes in not only the issuer, but on how that badge and the learning design, which Tim was talking about before, how that's generated. There's, uh, there's some interesting work going on in Scotland at the moment uh, with the SSSC, which is around social services and their um, social care, and they're looking at a kind of they have a skills map, if you like, and a skills curriculum already, and they're negotiating with another country at the moment and looking at how their two maps map together, and then how badges could represent skills on on that map. So I think a lot of it's actually going to come down to people negotiating. Yeah and just comparing and doing that stuff offline and then announcing that they, um, that they support them. And I, I didn't talk about the SQA, uh, which is on a, a previous slide. Um, and Doug and myself have done quite a lot of work in, in Scotland talking to those guys. And as a qualifications authority for a country, 
they have now supported the open badge standard and said to the schools, well, what we would like you to do is create badges which map to, it's called the curriculum for excellence there. So I think it's those kind of uh, organizations coming forward and supporting and saying, you know, this, this makes sense that will we'll also make, uh, make a big difference as well. There's a question here as well. Oh, good. Yeah, so that was what um, Tim showed you earlier. If I can go back enough, <laughs> there's quite a few slides in here. Um, it's the metadata which is in the badge. So here we are. Look. Someone's clicked on the badge. Now, this has the minimum amount of information in this particular badge. So the, the absolute essential stuff in there, which you, you couldn't create an open badge without, um, is the, the criteria, what, what this badge is for, who issued the badge, um, and who was issued to. Now, this particular one doesn't show who was issued to at the moment because it's just the metadata on, a, on the generic badge. Once that badge has been issued, it's got the metadata for that particular person. So if I tried to steal Tim's badge and put it into my badge backpack, it wouldn't work. It would reject it because it was issued to Tim with email, his email address and his credentials as, a, as opposed to mine. So that's how that works. It would just completely reject it. But there's lots of more stuff you can put in here, like the evidence, like I said before, like any standards that it aligns to, any tags, anything like that. So the evidence is optional. You don't have to put the evidence in. If, if the issuer decides to put the evidence in, it comprises a link. So you see where it says site, it comprises a link to that evidence. So anything that you can put on the web can serve as evidence. So if you have a learning management system and you want the evidence to be private, all you do is put it behind a login wall and there the evidence is private and you'd have to log in in any way that you do usually. Question here. Yes, go ahead. Right, so I'm gonna, um, you're gonna have to come back to me if I'm misunderstanding what you're saying here, but you're saying that um, because there's no issuing authority behind the Open Badges infrastructure, then the value of Open Badges is in some way spurious or lessened or something like that? That's correct. Okay, right, so um, the value of the Open Badges infrastructure is that it's a common standard on which you can build your particular certification, awards, or whatever. So Tim mentioned earlier that the Scottish Qualifications Authority are using the, are encouraging schools to use open badges. And what you do is you take an open badge and you map that onto an existing framework or map or standard or whatever you want to call it. So the legitimacy, the credibility or whatever it is comes through the issuing organization, but also on how rigorous the learning design is behind it, which is why I would very much encourage you to go and have a look at the badge canvas, which I've used in many workshops and which Tim's organization uh, produced. So it's an emergent value of a credential which can be used globally in, in a way which is recognized. Let's say, for example, you all issued me, you all went home today and you issued me a badge and I had, I don't know, like 100 badges in my badge backpack. First of all, I wouldn't have to show all of them. Second of all, you might des design them in ways which are more or less rigorous. Thirdly, you might come from organizations which I recognize or I don't recognize. So the value is always to the learner and the learner is in control of what they want to display at any given time to whatever audience. Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement yep. John okay. with John there, with the badge, mm -hmm. the So that's, that's a, a naming convention. If you don't want to, I'm going to use my stage privilege to cut you off here. So um, it's, you're calling it a, a badge, but like I said before, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it a micro-credential. Well, We're calling the open badges infrastructure. Just, just, just going to add to that. I mean, I, I think, A, we've got a system that already recognizes learning through awarding bodies, so we don't want to replicate the existing system. And B, uh, the eBay power seller badge is a badge, but it just, it just yeah. means thinking about value completely differently. When, when badges are on the web, they're not toys, they're things that drive multinational businesses through thousands of interactions over time. And look at Stack Overflow, that's connecting people to real jobs because it's identifying real experts. So I think it does, it, it is, a, it is a, a leap, I think, in understanding how credentials are gonna be valued in the future um, when, you, when you put the web into the mix. Thank you very much for that.
I'm sure both these gentlemen will be hanging around mm -hmm. afterwards, so if anybody would like to uh, pick up with them on, uh, on a point, I'm sure they'll be uh, available for a few minutes afterwards, uh, holding fire on their champagne just for a few minutes so that they can, uh, uh, you can ask a question. So a big round of applause for Doug Belshaw and Tim Riches. <laughs> Next up, we have wearable technology. Um, a lot of you have heard of Google Glass. Uh, I have to confess I've never even seen it, but I have now. There it is. <laughs> uh, but I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. So please let me welcome David Kelly. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for sticking around for the last session of the day so we could talk about uh, some future technology. Uh, to get things started, First off, a disclaimer, uh, thing, thing here, this bit URL here, I'll show it again at the end. Uh, the slides that, I that I'm gonna be sharing with you and a number of different resources that you can use to learn about how Google Glass could be impacting learning and education. Go to that URL, it'll go to a blog post with the slides and all different resources. And again, this link will be there at the end as well. And a bit of a disclaimer, my apologies, this session is not about Google Glass, um, but don't leave. The reason that I say that this session is not about Google Glass is because I don't want to talk about tech so much. I will talk a little bit about it, but the, the, the conversation about Google Glass, especially as it relates to education, has limited amount to do with the tech. We need to understand the tech in order to explore what's really important. And what that's, what's important is the possibilities that the tech opens up for us. It's not about what this thing can do, it's about what possibilities the technology is opening up for us. So a couple of other things just to set a baseline. When, it come, when we're talking about Google Glass, this is not something that is publicly released yet. This is something that I'm, I got, I was able to get Glass as part of the Explorer program that they have, which is they gave, the, they, they gave you the right to purchase, uh, which is just wonderful that I, I had the right, pay for the right to uh, participate in a beta test. But essentially, this is a beta test technology that has been evolving. Every, every week or so, I get an update in the software and the, the firmware that goes there, and it introduces and tweaks different types of functionality. So what we're gonna be talking about today might, is going to still evolve by the time it becomes a public release, which the latest rumor is uh, possibly April of this year. So let's set some baseline. What is Google Glass exactly? First off, it falls under the heading of wearable tech. It's probably one of the most commonly referred to pieces of technology in that wearable tech field. It's got a full color display, which goes right above, it's, it's right above your field of vision. Right now, the, with the glass that's on my face, is not obscuring my field of vision at all. If I wanted to look, at, right now if I just got a prompt and I wanted to look at what the display is, all I do is I just take a small glance upwards and I could see exactly what was on the display without necessarily obscuring my field of vision. I have driven with this on, I'm not the person who got the ticket um, for driving with this on, but one of the things that this does very well uh, is, is you have the ability to do navigation through it. So I'm wearing this and I'm getting prompts audibly and with a, with a screen about what where I need to go, how, I'm, where, how I need to get there, and it's much less distracting than actually taking my eyes off the road to look at a GPS. It's got a camera on it, it does, it does still pictures, it does video. It's got a touchpad on the side, which helps you go through the interface. You, you can tap on it, you can slide through it to get different things. It's got a bone conduction speaker. I don't know much about bone conduction, but I can tell you that, meaning that it doesn't really work that well. Uh, it's, dif it's difficult to hear. The new version of Glass actually comes with a mono earpiece that helps you hear, helps you hear, hear, hear a little bit better. It has a microphone so it can record audio. It has networking capabilities. It does not have onboard networking capabilities, so I can't hook this up to my Verizon account, but I can tether it to my phone or I can hook up to Wi-Fi hotspots. And one of the things that's very important to realize with Glass is it has strong links to other Google products. The reason that I say that this is something that's important to realize is when, especially as it relates to learning, when we do talk about helping people learn, we're talking about creating experiences. And one of the things that Glass does very well because it is so linked to the Google ecosystem is creating an, ex an experience based on how much, not Glass, but Google knows about you. And Google knows a lot about you. It's also based on apps like your phone, referred to as Glassware. And so, and again, this, this opens up the door to the, the idea of the possibilities again. The hardware is one thing, but it's the people who are making these apps and developing these software applications that are really gonna explore what's possible through this hardware. So, very briefly, how does this, go, how does this technology work? It's got the touchpad. There's a timeline on here that if I touch the side of it, I get a screen and I can go through and just look at different things and tap on it and I get different options that I could do just by tapping and swiping. 
It also has voice commands, so if I, as soon as I touch the main screen, I get a prompt on the screen that says, OK, Glass. And then based on the fact that it recognizes that, I get a whole bunch of options. I could say, take a picture. And it just did that. Took a picture, it would say, record a video, do a video call. Different things you could do, hands-free, uh, it'll just take the audio prompts. Just a quick read and, uh, a list of the different types of functionality that Glass has. It can do a Google search. You can get information on it. You can do navigation, as I was mentioning earlier. I could make a phone call. I could do video calls. I could do posting updates to Facebook, to Twitter, to Path, and a number of different other apps. I could record video. I can take still pictures. I can send text messages. And I can take notes. When you look at this list, one of the things you're going to realize is that that's, a, that's pretty much a, a laundry list of the different types of technical things that you can do with Glass, which you might be reading that list and going, I can do that with this. Why do I need this? And you'd be right to be wondering that question. But again, it, it starts all going into this idea of possibilities and what, what is, what's different about glass than is your phone. And when we start asking those questions, that's when you start realizing that there are huge amounts of possibilities, especially as it relates to learning and performance. Now, one of the things you have to realize is this, this is a very different experience than using your phone. For instance, one of the things that I, I, you, you might, if you've seen me in the hallway, you might not have seen me wearing this. I don't wear this all the time, um, partly because I like to get from one end of the hall to the other end of the hall sometimes without being stopped. Because this is very distract. As much as I'm wearing this right now, and it's not distracting from what I'm doing, talking to you right now in any way, shape, or form, the distraction does not come from my experience wearing glass. The distraction comes from your experience seeing me wear glass. Because this is, there's no normalcy attached to this. This is a very disruptive technology as to where it is right now. Because people just aren't used to seeing this in any way, shape, or form. That's not a glass thing. That's a new tech thing. The guy who had the first brick phone and was walking around screaming into it because nobody could hear what he was saying, that was the same thing. That, that's the same experience with that you have with glass now. It's something that's not common. And you see it, and it just disrupts you because it's just different. But when we talk about the experience of wearing glass, it's really not so much about how I react to it. Because I can honestly say it is a seat for the user. It's completely seamless. Once you get used to the idea of the voice prompts and the, and the touchpad interface, wearing this is not a distraction anyway. And, it, and one of the reasons I like this as a wearable tech, or just wearable tech in general, is that if it's done well, it should just disappear. It should, be, it should feel very much like you're wearing glasses. If you wear, I mean, I don't wear glasses prescription, but I wear sunglasses. And one of the things that's nice about this is you can wear sunglasses on it. You can just attach sunglasses to it. And it just has a natural feel when you're wearing it for that purpose. But the real question is, how do people react around you with glass? And it comes down to three primary reactions. Well, everyone reacts differently, but I can kind of throw all the reactions I've gotten into three primary buckets. First one is, wow. You have Google Glass. Let me see it. Can I touch it? Can I touch it, please? And that's, that's the people who are the, the techno geeks. And that's, that's a pretty good, good combination. People say, oh, I've never seen it. Can I touch it? Can I see what it's like? Curiosity. Second reaction is the one of confusion, of people who don't necessarily know what Glass is. And they're looking at it and saying, um, do you know you've got a computer strapped to your head? Or there's something on your head. Do you know it's there? Um, which I've actually had someone said to me, yes, I've, I'm aware that I have this on. Thank you. Uh, but those are, the, those are the first two reactions. The third one, which is oddly the most prevalent, consists of three basic words. Because this is very disruptive. This is something that a lot of people look at and go, you look like a fool. You look like someone who, and one of the, and the, the person, I, I, I've never actually met this, this celebrity, but the person who says, probably gives this reaction to, the, me, to me the most is my beloved wife who we have spent many a weekend negotiating around glass. All right, listen, you can wear it when we go to the mall if you promise not to wear it to the wedding on Sunday. <laughs> and, and that's because there's, there's that level of discomfort with this, what this is right now. But again, it goes down to the whole idea of normalcy. But this, that's realistically where this technology is right now. I can, I can honestly say right, it's getting in the, in the US, it's getting to be a little bit easier. I was at a conference, speaking at a conference last week. You, you go back six, seven months ago when I was speaking at a conference and I had this on, I was the only person in the building who had this on. I was at a conference last week and there were probably five of us. But the idea of somebody walking in with this was not as distracting now. 
because it's more, becoming more readily available, at least in the US. But most people, as, as it becomes more common, this idea of you're an idiot is going is to go die down a bit. That reaction has also made a new term, um, which is very, very, I, I, I'm not going to dispute this term. I, 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 will, I, am, I will try and embrace it myself. Uh, but it, it's a very common term because one of the things you'll, one of the other reasons, I mentioned I don't wear this all the time. I don't necessarily see glass as, at least in its current form, as a technology that I'm going to wear 24-7. If I wear glass, right now there hasn't been an app that is so integrated into my day-to-day into my -day life, my day-to-day -day activity, that there's a reason for me to wear this. The, the, the majority of the stuff that glass can do, I can do on my phone in a different, in a different manner. There are, the only time I'm going to put on glass is when I want to test it out, or when I'm testing something that is very um, intuitive, where it's, where it's just using it for that particular purpose. One of the, one of the things that I do like about glass, probably the most, uh, the, the, the big, best example I can give you of that it's different experience with the phone is I use Evernote all the time to do different sorts of things. I'm, it's, my whole life basically is going through Evernote in one way, shape, or form. And it is very, very, the experience of having to stop, take out my phone, open up the app, take a picture or, or make a note, and then close it out is very different than, than hitting this, saying, hit, hitting this, say, take a note, reading something off, the voice recognition is really, really well, and just having it go to my Evernote. It's, 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 it's very much in the moment as compared to the interruption of having to use my phone. But this is a very common um, issue, and because most of the people who are going around with glass are wearing glass because they want you to see that they are wearing glass. It goes back to that whole idea of normalcy. So let's talk about what this all means, what this technology really means for learning and development, because that's, that's really the core of the message that I want to talk about here. It opens up a lot of doors. First off, the, the question that I would use to best position why this, there, there are three major ways, in my opinion, that glass is important to learning. The first one that I would give is probably the most important, and I, and I position it with a question. What part of the body does glass impact most? Most people look at it and say, well, it's, it's your eyes, it's your, it's, your, it's your ears because of different things. It's your eyes. You can do all these different augmented reality things with glass. It's not. It has nothing to do with where glass rests on your body. It's your hands. The mere fact, there are, there are things that I can do on everything, just about every hard, hardware type of thing that I could do on glass, I could do with my phone. But the fact is, if I'm going to do it with my phone, I'm holding it. And therefore, I, can't act, I have to stop what I'm doing so that I can use the phone. Whereas with glass, now suddenly my hands are free. One of the experiments that I, that I was talking, talking with people doing is this can, this can do live video. So instead of calling someone and saying, listen, I don't, know, I, I don't know how to change my oil. Can you tell me how to do it? And having them listen, talk to me through it over the phone. Now I have a video chat where they're looking on the computer and they're not seeing me like on a webcast. They're seeing my engine and my hands. And they're, they're coaching me through what to do. That has huge implications. Just, just the mere fact that your hands are free is completely changing the paradigm of what performance support can be. And this technology is going to enable that. So certain, there are a lot of people who are exploring what this can do for learning. And I want to mention just a couple of specific applications that people are starting to explore with Glass. First one being very immersive training. The glass, one of the areas that glass is really being explored in depth is in the medical field. And you have, you have situations where you have a surgeon who is doing surgery with glass on. And he's narrating his work as he's doing it. And in another room, you've got less experienced surgeons who are watching it live. It used to be a case where they did this before and they had a, a stationary camera positioned above the operating table. But now you have the context of the surgeon actually wearing it. You can see his hands up close. When he turns, you can get the, the, the little, little subtle details about when the surgeon is turning to do different things and when he's turning away. Very, the subtleties that are captured based on that first person perspective are huge. The same scenario can be flipped around to talk about how you can use glass for performance support. Maybe it's not the surgeon who's the expert. Maybe it's the people who are watching that are the experts. And they're watching a novice perform surgery for the first time. You don't want to be that patient, obviously. But you're, well, they're watching a, ner a novice who's, who's not used to doing the surgery, and they're coaching him along as, they're, as he's actually in the work. So much of learning is you need to stop working so that you can learn. This enables us to really bring, bring it, get to that holy grail point of using learning, embedding learning right into the work. Another example, real-time feedback. 
If you were going to be doing something, you can get prompts of real-time feedback. I've been getting it while I've been doing this session. Every now and then I've gotten a beep and I can see a tweet that someone is sending out in this session about what, what they're go what's going on. When I see a tweet that people are sharing things, that's valuable. When I see a tweet that says, what is he doing? That gives me a little, okay, I might want to do things a little bit differently right now. But you can get real-time feedback in the, in the act of doing a job. Augmented reality is going to be huge for Google Glass. The idea that you can have, have a real-time real environment that Glass is giving you an augmented view where, the, where the, the video image is going to be recognized by software and contextually give you different types of feedback to, around the environment that you're on, there's going to be enormous applications for this. High-risk training. How, this is an example of someone who's doing a job on top of a cell phone tower. I get vertigo just looking at that picture. But th th this is not an environment where someone, th in this environment, you cannot really capture the depth of what this job is if you're just describing it in front of a classroom. Whereas if, per if this person is recording what he does in the job, it's much more powerful. In addition, you can see how far this guy had to go up to do this job. Let's say he gets up there and he sees something that he's not, he didn't expect. He has to climb all the way back down, figure out what to do, and come back up. Where if he has this on, he could just set up a video call with him, show someone in the back office exactly what he's seeing, and get coached on what he needs to do. Real-time performance support is going to be huge with this. So I want to give people a chance, and I know we're a little short on time, but a couple of key points that I want to mention about Google Glass, which is very important to me. First off, Google Glass is still a novelty. There's no normalcy to it. And the reason I have this picture, that's my son. When I look at him playing with this, he has no preconceived ideas. Everything is possible. That he's not embarrassed about wearing this. He's not thinking that it's silly. He's just like, that's really cool. What can it do? And what I love is, is, this, is just listening to him. I learn so much from my kids just in general, but listening to him explore the possibilities of it. Daddy, can this see through walls? Can I look through the next room with this? No, but that's a really cool idea. And he's, he's looking at it, for him, there's no, there's, it's completely normal for daddy to be walking around the house. In fact, he's always asking where it is when I'm not wearing it, which my wife loves. <laughs> the, when, when we talk about Google, uh, Google Glass, freeing the hands is huge. It's going to open up new opportunities for learning and for performance support that has been out of our, out of our possibility in the past. And lastly, the true potential of Google Glass has nothing to do with the hardware in terms of what it actually does. It's a matter of what can it do? What are the possibilities? What are the different ways that we can apply this technology for learning in ways that, that can open up doors that have previously been closed to us? So with that, I thank you. I hope this has been somewhat enlightening for you. Again, if you want to learn more about Google Glass, there's a lot of different writing, um, blog articles that I've written, and also articles just from around the web I've been curating. Uh, related to glass around the web. Just go to that URL. You will find all the different details that you could possibly want to learn about Google Glass there. Question? It did come up a question, but it strikes me that it's not just about freeing the hands, but it's good for people who have no hands. Oh, absolutely. If you, didn't, if, you didn't hear the, if you didn't hear the comment, it's not only good for freeing the hands, it's good for people who have no hands. One of the articles that you'll see there is for a, a person whose life has been changed by glass who's a paraplegic. Who just how they how, how the world has opened up to them, just based on wearing this. Um, some of the technology that this can do. I know Google's a little uh, is not is kind of trying to lock down facial recognition software, but this has the ability to do that. Think about an environment. I know my my, my grandmother my, before she passed had Alzheimer's disease. The idea that she could have had something like this that when I walked in the room it recognized my face and said, "This is David. He's your grandson." That could have made, saved her from a lot of aggravation. So there's, there's a huge amount of I, I, ways that this, this type of sort of technology can help people. Yes, the, the newest, ver the, 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 you'll see, if you do some searches on that right now online, you'll see a lot of stuff that says Google Glass now comes in prescriptions. It doesn't. Um, it's, it's not that Google Glass comes with prescriptions. They now have prescription lenses or prescription frames that are specifically built in a way that this naturally fits over it. But as long as you, you, this will fit over prescription frames, that you can, you can have your prescription see through it and it work, and works out fine. I know there's a lot of people who in, have, have been makeshifting 3D printed uh, adapters to have this go over different types of frames. But now, once it goes mainstream, there will be many different ways to adapt it for prescription frames. So some other hands? Question? Yeah. 
It's not, it, there is, they haven't announced the date. Uh, Google is, is very, to, they, they haven't announced it in any way, shape, or form. They don't, they don't let that go public. I don't think they've even decided yet. The rumor, that, the latest rumor is somewhere around spring of this year. Uh, but then again, if you went to the rumors that were going on in September of last year, it was probably end of last year, early this year. So it's, it's, it's been pushed out a little bit. I can tell you that they're closer to it because this, this set, set that I'm wearing right now is actually version two, which is closer to the production unit that's out there, um, that, that they made some hardware changes to get it closer to what needs to be out there for a consumer device. Yes? Yes. After all of that, talking about showing off your hands and being able to see what the wearer can see and all the rest of it, is there an alternative to a glasses jacket that would work as well? Or do you think that it really is going to be fashion oriented? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. Wearable tech goes well beyond Google Glass or something like that. Um, I think that there is, when, when you talk about wearable tech, you've got sensors in many different levels embedded into your shoes, embedded into your clothing, embedded into all sorts of different things, all of which are generating data, which is going to be huge. Um, if you wanted that first person perspective, of the, because that's one of the things that is huge with, with Glass, is giving, giving you that user experience, um, then I think that it's going to require some level of it. I do think that when we look at this technology right now, if you, five, year, five years from now, this is going to look like it's a bucket on top of my head. Uh, I, think, I, I think, personally, and I think this kind of goes through it, I don't, think, I don't look at Google Glass as, as a ground-breaking technology. I don't think that it's going to be something that, literally, Google Glass is going to be something that, that changes the world the way the iPhone did or something like that. But I do think that we're going to be looking at wearable technology two, three, five years down the road, that is a game changer that we look back on and say, you know, if it wasn't for glass, we wouldn't have this. That this is opening the doors to new ways of thinking. If, uh, Consumer Electronics Show list, this year, one of the big things was wearable tech just in general. And it's, it's showing how expansive this idea of wearable tech is, but it's also showing that, it's, that we, we're figuring it out as we go along as to what it is. So I do think the first person perspective, you're gonna need at this point something like this to do that. Uh, but that's today. I don't know what's going to be coming on tomorrow. Other questions? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I will say that the, the first time I've done it, it's a little disorienting to me. Because, you know, and ju just for, based on the fact that, you know, right now they call it video calls. When it first came out, they said it's, it's a Google Hangout, which many of you probably are familiar with. I'm used to the Google Hangout of I can see you. But, and, and, and when I do the Google Hangout, I can see you on here now. It, when it originally came out, I couldn't. But, so I, I would see this, but you would not see me. You would see my hands. And it's a little, dis it, once people get used to it, it's, it's, you know, at first it's just kind of like, well, I, I'm, what am I looking at? Oh, I'm looking at your point of view, and all right, now you're going to do this. And I've, I've done it, the person, the person I've done it with, most with, I've done it with three separate times. And now that when, when we do it, it's very natural for him. He's like, oh, well, all right, turn to the left. It's going to be over here. Wait, wait, you, you had this tool. Where is it? And, I, and I'm doing this. And go, oh, there it was, right over there. So it's more natural from that perspective. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I would add to, to, to that point is that one of the things that Glass does in that context is, is give you just that word, context. One of the things that, that I, um, one of the first things I did is I did a video recording of me driving. And it was, and, and so the type of thing where I'm, I'm, gonna sh I'm going to record my performance in a particular skill and I could share that video with someone else who can then critique it. And what's interesting is driving was a great example for me because when you're driving, your experience is generally focused on this much. It's pretty much the car in front of you, the, the, the lanes on each side. You kind of contextually around it. But most of your focus is pretty much on, I don't want to hit that car that's right in front of me, where your, your conscious focus is. But when you're looking at the recording through glass, you get a huge amount of context. You know, the, one of the things I found most interesting when I was doing that was when you look at the recording, where my focus was, was on probably 10 to 15% of what the view of glass caught. Glass caught the, the console in front of me. It caught the rear view mirror. 
It caught the side view mirror. It caught all these different things that gave you the full context around my driving. So for instance, one of the first things that I noticed when I was critiquing that video myself was, I have one hand on the wheel a lot. Those are the subtle things that you can do in, in terms of evaluating someone's performance that you would not necessarily even consider when you're, when you're critiquing it yourself. What, moral conundrums related to glass. Um, I, I, in terms of the Borg, which is a term that I hear a lot, that we're all, we're all gonna be just joining the Borg, um, I don't think that that's, that this, that you're gonna be getting prompted a lot. And right now there's a lot of user control. There, there are apps that I've tried out, that I tried out for five minutes and I went back online and said, oh no, I'm gonna turn that off because it was just annoying and it wasn't really contextually relevant to me. Context is very huge with Google Glass. Um, and I think it's gonna be very big in, in terms of its applications for learning too. But in terms of the moral implications, part of, one of the things you're gonna see a lot about Google Glass is privacy. The idea that I have a camera that can capture you at any given moment is huge. You wanna talk about a, the, the, the uncomfortable aspect of glass? Put this on, forget that you're wearing it, and walk into a men's room. <laughs> then, this, that you, then you will learn about the moral implications of Google Glass. Um, but, but it's, it, there, there are gonna be those questions. When this starts to get mainstream, there are, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm based in New York, so I'm in New York City with this a lot, and there, that's one of the places that is a hub for Google. So you see this a lot in New York City. There's not, there's a, a, it's closer to normalcy there. It's enough of a normalcy that there are now a lot of establishments that have Google Glass policies. You can wear it here, you cannot wear it here. Uh, because they don't, there's not an understanding and there's not a normalcy to it. And the fact that I, have, you know, I, can't, I, I can't wear this in a, the movie theater in my house, I can't wear this. They're afraid that I'm gonna turn it on and, and I'm, gonna record, I'm gonna pirate the movie. Which, to which my response is apparently you have not heard about the Google life of Google Glass yet. Uh, it's not gonna record a 90 minute movie. But th th there are, this, there's going to be a lot of th that discussion once this hits mainstream. Question? Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Fantastic. David Kelly. Thank you.